Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I am teaching a machine learning course and we're going to talk about isotonic regression. Next week or next lecture we'll get into um, Bayesian regression which will be interesting too but I thought why not since we've talked already about linear regression using ordinary least squares we talked about doing rich regression we talked about using the last so introduced l1 norms and so forth i thought why don't we try to do something a little bit more flexible with regression so what's the motivation is we want to cover a more flexible variant of linear regression it allows us to build models in a piecewise linear manner it's a linear model but it's piecewise and it also allows us to encode into it a constraint a monotonic constraint. The function must be increasing or level. It cannot have a negative slope. Now that's interesting because we're always concerned about how do we incorporate physics or other types of information sources. So the idea of encoding a monotonic constraint is really kind of an interesting one from the perspective of how we constrain our machines. Now let's do a real quick recap on linear regression. No surprises here. We talked all about it. We probably way too much about linear regression. In fact, the basic equation, multilinear regression, we're just doing this really a linear weighting of all of our predictor features plus an intercept term. And we'll be able to make estimates with that under the uh, assumptions of a linear model, linearity, of course, and homoscedasticity of the uh, error and, and so forth. And um, then we can formulate our loss function as shown down here. We're going to be taking a summation of the square difference between the values at our training data and the values that will be estimated by our model. It's just replacing and putting our model right here. And we'll try to minimize the sum of the squares in order to get our model, our best fit line to our data. Now, what are we going to do with the isotonic approach is we're going to say, well, the linear model is kind of inflexible. In fact, um, if we had a data set like this, if you look very carefully, it does kind of have a little curvilinearity to it. It goes up and then across. It's not quite linear. And if we fit a linear regression model to it, we're going to get something that in the middle has a high degree of bias, or maybe we compromise up here. There's going to be bias because we can't really fit that form very well. And so why don't we try to make our linear model more flexible by breaking up the problem into many or at least a few linear model segments. And so what we'll need to do is we'll need to put or establish isotonic constraints. It's just thresholds. And so we'll pick a set of threshold values. And now our problem becomes, can we estimate a linear model between each one of the thresholds such that we minimize the error with regard to the training data. And so what does that look like? Well, now our model has become a set of values that we would estimate at each one of our isotonic constraints, at each one of the thresholds. So our f of x1, x2, x3, all the way up to our final threshold, those estimates that's how we're now parameterizing the model. And it's assumed that to use the model, we simply have to apply linear interpolation between these points. So this is pretty interesting. In fact, we have a very flexible model, which does seem for our problem of having one predictor feature to be quite low as far as the burden or number of parameters go. To explicitly state what the model is, we can just look down here. In order to make a prediction with this model or set of estimates at each one of the isotonic constraints for the response, we're simply going to solve the linear interpolation for the specific bin that we're in. So we'll just simply identify which bin we're in, and then we can use this equation right here, which is simply linear interpolation. So not a big deal, not too bad, a pretty um, flexible model, very easy to work with. Now, we can also impose a monotonic constraint on the solution. The constraint simply looks like this. The estimate of the response at each one of the isotonic constraints is going to be set such that the first must be the lowest, the last must be the highest, 
and everything else must go in order as shown here. What does this mean? It means the slope of the solution must always be non-negative. We don't allow a decrease moving from one threshold to another. Well, that's fine. This is really cool because this provides us an example of constraining our model, our flexible model, with some type of knowledge. And in this case, we're making the statement that we know that the relationship between grain size and porosity must always be monotonically increasing. Now, how do we solve for these specific parameters? How do we solve for the estimates of the response at each one of the isotonic constraints. Well, we can move up and down, we can pick other values, but what's really cool is our loss function is the same as we had before with linear regression. We are simply going to minimize the L2 norm, the sum of the squares of the difference between the actual values of the response and the, the estimates that we would make along these lines, the linear interpolations. And so when we do that under the constraint, we add the additional constraint that we must have this monotonic increase. Now, because of this, we have this monotonic constraint. We lose our really nice closed form analytical solution. And we're going to now solve the problem using some type of an iterative manner in which we can minimize this loss function. The result is we get quite a flexible model. It's pretty powerful. We, instead of having our linear regression model that's going to create a significant amount of bias at locations where we deviate from linear behavior. We now have a model that's flexible enough to fit and model those nonlinear behaviors. Now there's always a downside. So what's the downside is for our problem which we had only one predictor feature, it's a pretty low parametric model, a low number of parameters to work with. It's not too bad. The problem is if we work with a high dimensional problem that as the predictor features M increases and we have a significant number of isotonic, isotonic constraints across each one of the features, well imagine in 2D we're going to have a mesh of values that we have to estimate. And in 3D it's going to be a three dimensional mesh and, and so forth. And so effectively, the number of parameters is going to go up k to the m. Now, just do a substitution there. Just imagine what would happen if we had k equals 10, like we did, and we're now working with m equal to, you know, a 10-dimensional problem and so forth. We get to the point where the number of parameters are very, very large. Luss and all have a paper back in 2012 in which they suggest that there is a significant risk of overfit for large k and their solution is to use, to be very conservative, to use the lowest number of K that you can to protect yourself from that. We can also do hyperparameter tuning. In case, spoiler alert, if you haven't realized that K is our hyperparameter for this model. And so we can apply the test train cross validation workflow in order to assess whether how well we do with different numbers of k and we'll do that shortly but let's go ahead and take and assume a k equal to 10. we'll assume monotonic increasing in this relationship and we'll go ahead and build a model now we've got the test data is in blue it's 25 percent of the data set and the gray are the training data and we go ahead and we build that model and we look at it and we go that looks pretty good what we have is the model shown, and no surprises, it is monotonically increasing. Here's a zero slope. This looks almost zero slope, maybe not, and here, but it does not go negative. And we have the training data in gray. It looks like we have a very good fit to the data. It looks reasonable. I don't see any type of systematic bias. It's very flexible. We have the testing data in blue, and the green are the estimates that we would make at the testing data locations. And so the error would be the difference right here. Okay, and it looks to be about symmetric, just an eyeballing it, ocular inspection on that. So once again, the hyperparameter for us is going to be K, the number of isotonic constraints or the thresholds we're going to use. And we could go ahead and do something kind of fun. We could set K equal to 100 and build a model that looks like this. And we're reaching a point that within the monotonic increasing constraint, we are clearly getting to a point where we are potentially overfit. 
Uh, it, it's pretty good though. It looks pretty robust. The variance explained in testing is 40%. We don't have a lot of testing data, so I'm not super comfortable in, in really trusting this variance explained. It's so few data, right? It's not very robust, right? It'd be probably better to do k-fold cross-validation. And then we have a variance explained for if we just do two locations. Now, of course, if we do two isotonic constraints on it, we're reaching a point where we're building a linear model under the constraint of the minimizing the square difference between the training and the model predictions themselves. And as long as we don't have a situation where we're trying to, where the data would be driving towards negative slope, we should be reaching a point where a model starts to look like linear regression. Now, what about hyperparameter tuning? Well, so what I did was I set up the model with the training and testing data, simple cross-validation still, and I ran it with everything between 2 and 35 isotonic constraints. And I calculated the variance explained in the testing data. Remember, there's not a lot of testing data. And because of that, when we looked at the result, we get kind of this cyclicity. Clearly, something's going on with the probably a harmonic where we have a certain number of thresholds or isotonic constraints and we see that we are getting close to certain training testing data and it's causing a good result then kind of a worse result and a good result and so forth but in general what's interesting is that we had pretty good performance right up front if we were to use you know pretty few like maybe five or so isotonic constraints. I'd be much more comfortable in making strong statements if we'd done a full k-fold cross-validation. All right, so that finishes up our discussion of isotonic regression. Now, I should comment, we brought it up because it was a nice idea to extend linear regression to be more flexible. It's the idea of producing a piecewise model is also very appealing, and that's a nice extension to our knowledge of machine learning. And Finally, from the perspective of having a hyperparameter that's related to the size of those segments or the number of the segments is also very interesting. I hope that you found this lecture interesting. I am Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I teach and conduct research in data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. And I'm always happy to discuss. I hope that you find this content useful to you. I am the Geostats Guy on Twitter, and also on YouTube, I have the Geostats Guy lectures, and on GitHub, I put all of the examples and workflows that I show within my lectures. For instance, this example that I showed in this lecture is available to you if you want to go ahead and try it out for yourself. I just uploaded a fresh copy with a couple of corrections and improvements, so go ahead and check it out, see if you find it interesting. All right. I hope this lecture was useful to you. All right. Take care.